How are you doing, Robert? Excellent, excellent. Where Where are you at? I'm in Miami right now. Beautiful. How is it there this summer? We've We've had a rough summer up here in Atlanta. You're in Atlanta? Yeah. Oh, very nice. I mean, you mean in terms of COVID and everything? COVID, the weather, everything. How's the scene down there? Yeah, I mean, the, the weather is changing all the time. You know, it's like hurricane to extremely warm. But in terms of the scene, Miami has always been, you know, pumped up. It's yeah, like, seriously. What a great we had a few months of, of lockdown, but I feel like it's the Florida and Miami is the one place that people just went crazy and like started going out. I really took care of myself. Like I just started going out like a few months out. Of course, you, you, you meet with, with close friends, you go to houses, you do like more selected things, you know, but going to a nightclub or to concerts, I, I really like stood away from that, you know, for like a, a complete year. Yeah, COVID has really spoiled so much. And Miami is just the scene. My my sister lived there for about five years in the 80s. Okay. And my brother-in-law's a drummer and he oh, just nice. loved the vibe. They're just yeah. everything, Coconut Grove, everything. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's just Coconut a Grove's a beautiful place, yeah. No, it definitely has some, some great places. Uh, I used to live in Boston in New York City. And then I landed here in Miami. I have I have a lot of family here and friends and and. I've been doing some production work, you know, but now that I'm going back to this artist thing with Blue House, um, who knows, I might move to LA, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta go where the work's gonna take you and where the creativity and your trajectory. Exactly, I feel like they're, they have a cool scene. I have a bunch of people there from Berkeley that I know. Um, everybody that, that is there is, is doing something great, you know? That's awesome. So how long have you been in Miami now? Probably three years. I moved here early 2018. Nice, nice. Yeah. So the new album is out and it's hot. This is really good stuff. Thank you. I'm glad you, you like it. Hear that. I mean, I miss the true rock sound and just yeah. that influence. It's just so good. I mean, in these days, you know, it's just such manufactured stuff out there. Not that it's horrible. If that's your groove, that's great. No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a moment, right? Like, yeah, rock and roll kind of like maintains itself. And then over history, you have like all these different genres and situations appearing, you know, right now we're with, with like the Latin music and the pop artists. It used to be disco, right? It used to be grunge. It used to be, I mean, but if, but if we want to maintain a positive mindset, you know, we can say that rock and roll maintained itself. Uh, and once this like pop era starts dying out and we see a new thing that we have no idea what's going to be, rock and roll is still going to be there, right? It's oh, like, absolutely. it's yeah. like, the, how do you call it? The cement, just like holding everything and we just keep going, you know? Yeah, to me, it's like comfort food. I grew up with that stuff and yeah. get into this a little bit about the Led Zeppelin influence. It's like, okay. that to me, going back to that, it's like that's childhood for me. It's it just... You know, for people around my age and older, obviously, it's like, it, it is, I feel like it's comfort food. Like you, it's the tribe, the true, the familiar and people who have that influence in their music now, it's, you know, I, I flock to go get that kind of music and to hear it live. So it's really Exactly, nice. also the live situation like really, really shows a band or an artist or, or, or what they can do, you know, and rock and roll is, it's, it's just something powerful live. And, and, and this festival era also helps for that rock and roll to come back because people start going to see bands live and it's very different to just hear uh, an artist just maybe like singing to a track with no one on stage um, versus like what a band is, you know, like even, I mean, Foo Fighters is, is, is rock. It's not classic rock, but it's pretty rock and roll. And if you see like, the, the concerts they, they've been doing and the Lollapalooza headlining show they did, that was, the energy just was just insane, you know? And I don't oh. know if you have that energy with, with something else. It's great to say that, it really is. And, and you've done some Lollapaloozas and stuff like that. Yeah, What's that feeling yeah. like? God. Yeah, I, I haven't done the Chicago yet. That's, that's a must that I, I hope to get in with Blue House, but I used to be in another band that I formed in Berkeley were called Stone Giant. 
And in 2016, we, we got called up to go to Lollapalooza, Argentina and Chile. Nice. And it, was, I was, it was the first big festival that we were playing. And the thing about those situations is that from all the traveling and meeting the people and being backstage and everything, your show is just 45 minutes of that whole experience. So everything in, it, in its entirety, like ends up being the experience, you know, like I, I, I got the situation to meet uh, Jesse Hughes from, from Eagles of Death Metal, you know, nice. that, that was a powerful encounter. Like we, he, he just kind of like stopped and he'd ask for a lighter um, to, to light up like a cigarette. And we just ended up talking for like an hour he oh, knew the band because he 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 heard our music from the from the lineup. He, I mean, he ended up. Remember the the, the Paris situation with the shooting, yes, the Bataclan theater there. Oh my, yeah, that's you know, it, it's one of those crazy things because I remember like three months earlier, I went down to Argentina to visit some 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 friends, and I and I did a um, an interview for the TV there down there, and I said, who do you want to meet? And very like without knowing the future, I said, you know what, I, I, I hope to meet Jesse from Eagles and, uh, and, and just comment about what that, that bad experience was. And, and at one point of the conversation, he opened up to us and he started talking about that situation and he started crying. And we like all hugged Jesse and it was just like powerful experience. And, and then we were like, uh, Tame Impala was there, you know, uh, you, uh, I, I remember. Being, I remember being in Chile, and we woke up to to have breakfast before going to play. And Alabama Shakes was there, just oh, having no, waffles, you know, like, and and, wow. and and you see like all that experience, and and you notice that these are just people, uh, hard work, hard working people, and and once you start like going into that train yourself, you start seeing that that if you just keep yourself going, you know. It's like an energy thing, you know, once you open that energy, I remember I, we started playing other festivals and then we would like bump into, I met the singer of, of Arcade Fire on a festival. Oh. And the next day I saw him at the airport and, and, and you know, like your energy starts getting aligned with these people and you start meeting them more. Um, I also met Skrillex at a party in Lollapalooza, Chile. Wow. And then I went to New York City and he was in the same bar that I was there, you know, you like the, the energy awesome. just started yeah. attracting. That never happened to me before. I never saw Skrillex in New York City in two years, but I go, I meet him in a festival and then I come back and he's in a bar, like, wow. right? So it really snowballs for you. You wanted to get into this music business and wow, it's one great thing after another. You're in a great community of people you've already met and it's still made. Exactly, the, the, the music industry and, and I, I guess every opportunity in life, it's like once you feel that you're in that momentum, you know, you, you have to roll with it because the doors just start opening. And maybe looking at my past with that band, uh, we would get like into very big opportunities, but then we, we weren't like completely using that momentum to grow all the way yeah uh, so at one point that's when i stopped and, and and i hope to to with blue house go all the way you know like let's let's talk in 10 years and see see what happened <laughs> totally well this is phenomenal great collection of songs how how did this whole project start uh, all in miami mm -hmm. and how long did this take to record yeah yeah um so i moved back from new york city to to miami and that's when I decided to leave Stone Giant. Um, the band is not really active right now because I, I was the singer and we were composing the songs, you know, it's like, it would be another band. Um, so that's when I was kind of, you, you know, you're kind of like, not lost, but it's like, okay, I've had all these years of touring and, and, and just like, this is gonna be the band of my life. And all of a sudden I'm in Miami with no band, what's going on, you know? So at the beginning of 2019, I put my, my shit together you know sorry for the for that. A, <laughs> no censoring on podcasts yeah said. put, put <laughs> my shit together you know and um and i started writing i started i said you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna go more bluesy more more like uh, with my influences and just write what comes natural to me without influence from other writers 
uh, and the first demo I wrote was Purify My Soul, which is the first song on my album. Um, Beautiful. And then I just wrote literally tw in 2019, I probably wrote 200 demos in one year. Yeah. Uh, and then I decided for this 13 songs, I began the production at the end of 2019. And then I, fi and then I had to like, um, somehow finish the production during the COVID. So I was sending tracks to LA uh, for the drummer to, to record, which is the same drummer as Stone Giant. So I, I, I kept him. Once you find a good drummer, you don't, you, you do don't, not yeah. let him go. A, a good drummer will just change everything. Um, and from there, we just finished production. We finished the lyrics, we finished everything. And then we recorded. I produced it myself with my company, Little Sweet Records uh, and, and my friend, David. David uh, Volvo, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we just literally finished it at the beginning of this year. We sent it to the Orchard, our distribution label, and, and here we are. Nice sounding, nice sounding album. Purify My Souls uh, all over YouTube. This is just like, what was that experience like doing the video for that? Yeah, that, that, was, that was like uh, one of the first videos I did. Um, very basic, just went out to the streets of Wynwood and, and just kind of like walked, you know, and had that, that, it was like a fun shooting. And then we decided to mix, to mix like public domain videos that show situations that when you need to be purified you know and then the second oh. video i did was give it back but we didn't have an opportunity to go out and film something so so i just got a lot of friends and fans and people that were sending me videos you know uh and we did like a compilation of people in in lockdown just enjoying the song um and now i'm finishing my uh, a few videos that i'm going to be releasing uh soon Nice. So you're getting used to doing this whole video thing on top of just doing music. It's it's part of the whole. You scene. have to, right? But it, it's it's a we're in a visual era. The videos are very important. Um, but yeah, be, beyond all that thing that you got to do, the press, the photos, the the image, the videos. You know, I'm I'm mostly excited about just going out and play this thing and and feel the people. And I don't even know what this how the songs will sound live and how people will react to them you know so so i'm excited to have that that experience so what do you have plan planned as far as the tour goes and how extensive is that going to be yeah I, I mean a complete tour not yet of course i'm we're seeing how the situation with the world uh, is progressing what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a few strategic shows i'm going now to la to to film for jam in the van and something for orange kind of like a press press trip but then i'll come back and i'll do I'll, I'll do an event in miami presenting my album then i'm going to new york to do the same thing i'll probably go back to la do a show maybe nashville um yeah. you know until we can figure out the situation with the touring opening for bands let's see what festivals come our way for for next year so I guess for now, it'll be just like promoting the album, doing strategic shows, and once that cool opportunity to tour uh, and, get in, and get back to the festival thing comes back, you know, then we'll go for that. What would you plan to do? Would you have the full band? Obviously, you have your drummer. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have like a full band assembled, ready to go? Exactly. Yeah, of course. I, ha I have, a, I have a, a great net nerd, uh, network of musicians. Uh, from Berkeley and from people that I know. So that gives me the freedom to like choose who I want to play based on, on. at the beginning, I'll do it like that, you know, uh, based on location, based on experience, based on the gig. I, I know who, who can play for me, you know, with that level of, 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 pro yeah. of professionalism. But of course, once like the big opportunity comes or a full tour, I have like the, the musicians that I would, called like the 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 a team you know but it, it's a nice a nice situation because you are not tied to people right um sometimes when you're in a band you want to do a gig and maybe the bass player cannot make it or the keyboard player doesn't want to do it or or who knows it's 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 not anymore just you deciding it's everybody deciding it's a democracy right the way so, it should be yeah that's good
And so, so like give me the freedom, you know, hey, I want to do this tour. Bass player that I want can't make it. I'll, I'll call somebody else that, that I, I feel good playing with, you know. Maybe over the, over the years, I established like the band. These are the, the people on stage always. But at the beginning, I'm going to experiment a bit, you know. Right. And see, and see who can bring it. <laughs> I think even the big legacy artists do that too. They always have an understudy because, you know, you get out there, look at the Rolling Stones. I mean, their drummer yeah. been with them 60 years or whatever. <laughs> he can't make it on this tour. So they yeah, have. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, you got Steve Jordan now on the drum. So that's going to be. I mean, you you don't go wrong with Steve Jordan. Yeah, he's been ready from day one, I'm sure. Yeah, for yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's really awesome. Yeah, they're coming here to Atlanta. Not every city. It's, you know, these no filter tours are kind of limited. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's going to be exciting, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You have a whole cast of characters on your new project. Uh, some people who even work with David Bowie and Niall Rogers. That's oh, really yeah. awesome. You got some real serious talent. What was it like working with some of these people? Yeah, yeah, that experience with Marielle, the, the backing vocal singer, was, was funny because I was looking for a gospel singer. This was like at the end of the production, the only missing link I was needing was a gospel singer to just like back me up on those chorus. Um, I, I called up a friend and he recommended someone and I, we called her up to the studio and we didn't really know about her, her story. So at the end of the recording, she just started telling us a bit of who she was. And we were like, oh, oh and, and we ended up having like a two hour conversation about all of the, her experiences awesome. with, with Michael Jackson, with Prince, with a bunch of artists. So it was, it was very powerful. And she has like that gospel energy, you know? Oh, it adds so much to that. It's great when you find people like that who've just been with huge names and they develop and they it just it, they make it look very easy. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and she was very excited about the music, you know. Like, uh, so, I mean, to see somebody who has worked with those people and been in a recording with those people to feel good about what what you're doing is also reassuring, I guess. Um, but yeah, I recorded with a bunch of people that, that I feel comfortable with. The, the bass player is my good friend, Pablo. He, he's the bass player of this very big Latin artist called Ricky Martin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's been the bass player of Ricky for like four years now. And he lived here in Miami, so he recorded my album as well. The guitars, I did them all myself, the vocals. And then we also had another gospel saxophone player called Travis um Travis Bridges I think yeah. Travis Bridges yeah at the end of the song uh celebration yeah you can hear like a really cool uh saxophone solo and he came into the studio he improvised a first take and then he said okay let's let's start recording um but we were recording him anyways you know that's a rule of the studio you always record recording even when you're testing because we ended up doing a bunch of takes and we ended up choosing the first take that he improvised <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's great when you hear stories like that Some, sometimes i record guitars and i'm like don't ask me to do that ever again because i don't know what i did you know it just happened you know yeah so what's the writing process like? Do you always carry your the mobile phone and say, I got to record this right now, get it in the notes because yeah. it's going to go. Yeah. yeah, it's really a mix of everything. For me personally, I mean, every writer has its own own path, but I connect more with the music first, right? I, I, I focus on the riffs. I focus on what sound do I want? Do I want the drums to be like dancey or slow song? Am I writing a hard rock song? Um, I just start like, you know, improvising ideas, maybe over a loop or maybe if I'm jamming. And then from there, I start organizing the song, right? The song form, like this is going to be my verse. And then I'm going to go into a pre-chorus, a chorus, where I'm going to put the solo. After the solo could come a bridge. And once I have all that done, I start mumbling melodies over the instrumental track, right? And not even focusing on lyrics. Something if you, sometimes if you focus on lyrics, you limit your melodies. So I just mumble mel melodies in like a language that doesn't exist, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then once I get the melodies that I want, I try to think about what I want that song to talk about, 
What's the concept? What am I saying in this song? You know, the chorus is always the summary of a song, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if the song is about you like pizza, in your chorus, you're going to sing that you like pizza. But in your first verse, you're going to tell them that you went to the groceries, you bought a pizza, you know, maybe in the second verse, you're putting it in the oven and you're taking it out and you're smelling it. Maybe in the bridge, you, yeah. you, you drop the pizza and you're sad because you dropped it. But then you picked it up again and I'll eat it anyways because I like pizza. Boom, we go to our final course. So once you understand it, like I, I, I did a songwriting major in, in Berkeley. Um, so we were constantly studying all this. It's not like there are rules because you, 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 you end up doing whatever you want and you, you don't want to think about writing as rules, but there's definitely universal rules that, that work in songwriting. You went to the Berkeley College of Music. Uh, we don't want to give away your age here. I, not so long ago. Well, um, I'm, I'm 31. I, 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 my 20s were all about Berkeley and, and the Stone Giant Lollapalooza situation was when I was like 25. And then at 28, probably, I decided to leave the band. And so here I am. Let's see what the 30s are, are going to bring my way. <laughs> That's exciting. No, still young. Still have a lot of years ahead. That that's good. That's really good. I would never let say, oh yeah, I'm getting up to you know, and to have to like make goals at certain ages is kind of yeah, yeah. That that's that's really like the social media pressure that that they put yes. on people, or or like the pop situation that you got to be 17 and like this, you know. But music is done forever you can do it forever you can do it i mean i've seen bb king play at 83 years old in in i think it was uh worcester massachusetts yeah there you go um you know and i've and i've been reading about people that that just had long careers you know and like i love chris stapleton you know chris stapleton oh yeah yeah absolutely exactly so now he's like chris stapleton right but chris released his first album when he was 37 or 38 years old i believe yeah it's never so too writing in nashville a lot uh and then he did that so i mean you have to just do do your thing everybody has their moments you know yeah they do they do so what was it like being in boston i was just in boston last week as we speak i, I haven't and been in like three years to boston great great place and i uh went to fenway to see a concert and just oh, like yeah. The vibe there is amazing. It's just, what a great town. You must have had a great time at Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to live right, like, a few blocks from the Fenway Park. Oh, uh, beautiful. Berkeley is right there, you know, in Back Bay. Yeah. Um, I loved it. I mean, I lived there for, like, I did four years of Berkeley, and then I stayed one more year playing with the band. We moved to a house uh, with friends, and we would have parties, and we had a rehearsal space in the basement. All the bands we used to come there. It was like a movement, you know, and we were like the rock and roll band from Berkeley playing everywhere. Um, it's just it's just a great, great experience beyond the classroom. Right. Because you learn a lot outside the classroom in the jams or working with people or or at the, at the time we were like the rock band of, of, of the school. So everybody who was studying a production and recording were calling us to be like the guinea pigs of the of every recording so you start like really it's like a it's like a fake world before the real world you know so you get to experience all those situations that then once you are in a real life situations you're like okay i already did this plenty of times at berkeley you know yeah somebody else i met from berkeley's name is david rosenthal and he has worked mm -hmm. as a musical director one of the big names was billy joel who <laughs> still worked with yeah he was uh telling me it's just like that's exactly what, what that experience is like it's just a wonderful atmosphere and he has everything to thank for in that regard so you uh you have a jimmy page story how did that all come about yeah you're... yeah that's also another surreal situation that it's like how how did i end up here um that's totally surreal yeah during my teenage years i met someone um who months into the relationship um i found out that she was uh, jimmy page's niece and that's that's the, oh, cool. that's the true story of, of how it all started and it was very like the time that i was getting into led zeppelin for the first time i was like really like paying attention to my playing and, and playing the blues and decided to 
to like really dedicate my life to music. So it was crazy that all of a sudden I'm with this person that, that is connected to Jimmy. And I went to London when I was 19 and, and I went to his house. I met his family. He saw me play. He took me to the airport. We had a like a one hour chat. Uh, okay. I felt like I was a reporter because I, I couldn't stop asking questions. Sure. It's a, there's a funny story that I, I, I asked so many questions and what point the, the driver we went on a taxi like he called up a taxi and we went <laughs> this was before the, the it might get loud a movie remember yeah yeah so people, i i feel like people didn't yeah. didn't know how jimmy looked at that age before that movie um so we were in a taxi and then the driver looks at him and he's like who are you you know because i couldn't stop asking questions about jimmy Hendrix, about the beatles what how oh, sure. well you played here what do you do like tell me everything you know we even talked about soccer, everything. Oh, wow. Um, I and, I said, and I said, oh, you don't know who, who this guy is? <laughs> and he's like, no. And I did like a small pause and I said, I can't say it. <laughs> I can't say it, you know? Out of respect for him, I can't say it. Hey, I know, I would do it, yeah. I know. Next to Jimmy Page, before we crash, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would, yeah, just keep quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I said, okay, you, you're missing out. So, oh, that's awesome. Just, just kept driving. And then, and then, yeah. And then we said bye at the airport. Um, I used to call him sir the whole trip. The whole trip was sir, sir, sir. And then at the end, I'm like, sir, do you think we can take a picture before I go? And he's like, I appreciate you calling me sir, but you can call me Jimmy, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I have that in my head forever. So we took the photo. That's awesome. And it was very nice. We took the photo and he saw it and he's like, no, I don't like the background. Let's take another one. You know? like, and, and then I, I said, goodbye. Good luck with the movie. How are you going back home? I said, and he's like, oh, I'm taking the train. I'm like, you're taking the train just, yeah. like, just by yourself like that. Um, so yeah, that, that was like when I was 19. And then I had this feeling that I wanted to meet him again uh, through my own means. So when I was graduating Berkeley, they, what they do is that they give honorary doctorates to like big artists, you know, Steven Tyler, Bowie. Seen them, yeah. Everybody's been there. So I just made an approach and I told them this connection that I had, like very innocent without thinking that it was going to happen. And I was on vacation uh, and Berkeley called me up and he's like, yo, he's coming. <laughs> he's so coming. Awesome. He's coming, you know, wow. so... We ended up doing, we, we asked him if he wanted to play, I, but I feel, I felt like he just wanted to come, come and chill and enjoy the ceremony. So that opened up the opportunity for me to make the Led Zeppelin band. So yeah. I, I just started like calling all the rock musicians I knew from Berkeley and we did a concert for like 10,000 people at the Boston University, the Aganis Arena. And Jimmy was there on the fourth row. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. And we just played everything we, we had a few tequilas in the bar across the stadium and then we went on stage and it was just powerful, powerful. Yeah. I, I, I was graduating Berkeley. I never, I, before that, I never had 10,000 people like clapping, you know? So we, I remember we started the show, everything was dark and we were playing uh, good times, bad times. And by the time that song ended, <laughs> oh, Feel oh, it. Oh, what is this, you know? <laughs> yeah it was it was a great absolute absolute great night that it's just gonna stay with me forever i guess and it's where you are today this is what we're, we're how you build on that and it just snowballs and snowballs and put out a great project like this uh self-titled uh album this is fantastic where does the name come from blue house let's, let's see if, it, if if i go all the way you know we can invite jimmy to to play a solo at a festival or something that would be there you go that would yeah. be amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. So where does this name come from? Uh, Blue House. Yeah, Blue House is um, also connected to the... So I see this moment as like a rebirth. That's how I call it. You know, like I... It feels like I have this whole other life in Berkeley and New York and Stone Giant and all of a sudden I'm here. Yeah. Project. And the Purify My Soul situation is kind of like purify yourself for a new chapter. And Blue House was one of my bands uh, when I was a teenager and it was really the band that like made me 
like play live and it's like oh what is this feeling let's let's do it and we were called blue house but with a s instead of a z at the end because we were literally rehearsing at the drummer's house that was blue so we called it blue house we didn't want to write blue like exactly like the color and house yeah, like, yeah. we just kind of like blue house so i was trying to think about names before releasing my first song and i couldn't couldn't get the name couldn't get the name and then i said you know i'm going to go back to my beginning because this is a new beginning and i'm going to steal the name and just have it be my artist name you know it sounds like a band but it's my artist name it's kind of like a slash situation you know yeah yeah i, I like that yeah i mean that seems to be a trend too and in, in doing yeah, it yeah 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 and 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 even my friends nowadays you know they call me blue or like yo blue house you know and like i started like getting into that into that character and it's fun it's catchy it really is and when you go to market yourself obviously what you're doing now it's just easier to remember it stands out yeah. rather than going by you know the run-of-the-mill name that's yeah yeah sure. definitely uh definitely stacks up another great track on there is every day how did that one come about thank you, thank you. yeah that's the so that, that's the last song of the album. If you see the first song of the album, it's called Purify My Soul. And then the last one is called Every Day. Purify My Soul Every Day, right? Um, so the whole album is like purify your soul. There's a bunch of situations of, of like, you should be purifying your soul. And then Every Day is the track that, like if you think about it as a movie, in every day you're already purified and you're living in this light and sunshine every day. And I totally quote, nice. <laughs> it's, I totally quote on the chorus uh, a few songs. So it's like, I've been touching the sky every day. That's kissing the sky from Purple Haze. And a little tribute to that. Yeah. Looking for love in the sunshine, sunshine of your love. Wow. Um, yeah. And then riding, riding the highway to heaven. Oh. Right? There you go. Yeah. I totally quoted those songs, but like switched it. And in, in, in your own little way. Yeah. That's really, really sweet. You have that, a. That song just happened. You know, we were in the studio yeah. wanting like a powerful song. We were listening to Song Two by Blur. Remember that song? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I. So I kind of like copied that vibe, but made it into this song um yeah it was it was spontaneous we were on a night with david at the studio and it just happened we did it in like two hours and boom very great production uh you got a really good engineer in this too somebody who had worked with the black keys uh, that it's just oh yeah that's that's brian that's brian he's a mastering engineer the one who does the final step after you're done with everything you send everything to brian to be mastered uh, and yes, he's he's done the the, the Black Keys, the, the Brothers album. He's done Liam Gallagher. He's done Royal Blood. So he really knows that that uh, it's it's cool because I just send him, and I don't even have notes when he sends it back. It's like okay, I know that what you send me is what I'm supposed to release. I'm not. What what can I tell you? You know about the mastering process. You know better. So. Yeah, it's a gut instinct when having that kind of experience. And somebody like Brian Lucy is um, just one of these guys. Yeah, they just, they know it. They know what sounds good and you just got to trust them. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I could start saying a bunch of notes, but it's like, if wow. you thought that this should be the way to go, then I'll trust. That's why I'm sending it to you. Yeah, I think micromanaging in the arts is just such a bad idea. And mm -hmm. not that it couldn't work, but uh you know, you got to trust the people in your group and then let them fly it to the best of their knowledge. It, it always yeah, and it ends up being a more, a, a better experience for you too, you know, to have some, some help in, 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 in different aspects, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Groovy Records in Miami is the place where, uh, Groovy you... Land, Groovy Land Music. That's, uh, that's the studio of David. He owns that studio here in, in, in Miami. Yeah, and, and we've done most of my album there. We we produce other artists as well. The drums we recorded it in LA, between a studio called Silver Gun Records, and then most of the the songs were recorded at Revival, which is the studio of Earth, Wind, and Fire in LA, and it sounds great. You know the room, 
we, we wanted that like live drum sound kind of ZZ Top. So we like kind of copied the, the, the recording uh, logistics that they used to do, I guess. Excellent. So you moved here to the States. Where did you grow up uh, in Argentina? I grew, I grew up in Argentina. Yes. I'm, I'm very connected to the U.S. because I went to an American school when I was in Argentina. Uh, my okay. brother was born in San Francisco. I have family here, cousins. My family is American. I've been coming here to Disney World since I'm like three years old. You know, <laughs> I listen to, rock, to English rock and roll. Um, so, but yeah, I've been... I lived in Argentina most of my 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 youth. You know, I I moved out of Argentina when I was eighteen. Was so, in the rural area, or were you closer to Buenos Aires, or? Um... Yeah, Buenos Aires. Yes, yeah. Buenos Aires, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, sure. the rock and roll there is great. Yeah, you know, the bands love going there because the people just go insane. You know. Yeah, great audiences love, who love great music. I'm sure. What was it like the first time you really, you remember you were like stumbling on the first time you heard Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin? When, when was that? What, what age did you discover that? Yeah, yeah. I, I discovered that probably when I was 13. I used to listen to Green Day and Blink-182 and The Offspring. I used to listen to, to Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys. <laughs> I did that whole thing. Um, but at one point, uh, my uncle in Virginia, Martin, he looked at my iPod when we used to have iPods and he saw all this music and he was like, <laughs> let me show you the way. And, <laughs> and he, <laughs> he put in my iPod like all the Led Zeppelin records. He put all the Frank Zappa, Steve Vai, Pink Floyd, Iron Maiden, everything. And he, and, and he basically deleted all my other music. And he said, like, this is your new iPod now. And <laughs> I, I spent hours in his basement just listening to that with my headphones. And I remember going up and, and telling him, like, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened? He, like, he's totally responsible for changing my path. You know, I don't know where I would be right now. Doing you know, something so, else, doing something else because from that yeah, moment yeah. I just became very, very into rock and roll, and that's when I started like seeing uh, concerts uh, of Led Zeppelin like on YouTube and everything. I used to buy the DVDs of like the song remains the same, but it was really only when I was seventeen that I really started studying the blues and guitar and like what these people were doing. I always played. But I knew I didn't know what I was doing, you know. And at 17, I said, "Okay, now I'm now I want to know what to do." <laughs> yeah. And then when you went to Berkeley, I mean, it was basically like like a lot of jazz lovers there. So I, I, yeah, we actually turned Berkeley into a more rock and roll school. Yeah. Let me tell you, because we we I got in there and it was all jazz. I remember my first two, two semesters, I had to to play jazz. As, as my final exams, I played like Donna Lee by Charlie Parker. I played a blues by Wes Montgomery, but that wasn't who, it wasn't who I, who I was, you know, and who I am. So I d decided to just focus on rock and roll, form the band. I started like playing comfortly numb guitar solo on my exams. Like I'm not going to play jazz anymore, you know, just listen to, to my rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and then, like I said, we were like the rock band of the mo of, of, of the school and a lot uh, other rock bands start appearing. And then with the Jimmy Page rock and roll uh, graduation. So it definitely opened up uh, more to, to rock and roll. That's fantastic. Well, maybe as you get older, maybe you'll rediscover jazz and then be influenced. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it. I'm just not, uh, uh, I'm not such a jazz player, but I love, I mean, when I used to live in New York, I would go to Fat Cats or, or oh, it's great all, stuff. all these like bars and just you sit there. Yeah, yeah. And then some of my favorite artists like Sting uh, kind of dipped into jazz a little bit. I wouldn't have known about like jazz if it wasn't some of the artists that I was following as a kid. And they kind of put it a little bit into their project. Yeah. And, no, and you also have like the new jazz, uh, more groovy, like uh, John Schofield, you know, you know, uh, like that kind of thing. Uh, I love too about jazz. Robin Ford. Uh, it's it's like blues rock, uh, but jazz with groove, 
you know, it, it, they, they mix a bunch of things. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Well, that's fantastic. So uh, any, are you always writing for future projects and you might shelve it and then just get to it? Yeah, I'm always, I'm already writing the second album of Blue House and I, I just released yeah. one, the first one. Um, yeah, I'm constantly like doing demos. I get very like, uh, I, I go very fast from one idea to the other, you know, like I listen to the album now and I love it, but I would write it all over again. You know, it's like, sure. That's that so happens cool. to me. Like I write a song and then the next day, it was happening all over the production. You know, we, I, we were already decided for 13 songs. But maybe that night I wrote a song and I'm like, I was calling David like, yo, shouldn't we put this new song on the album? And he was like, no, no, relax. We already like in production, stop writing demos, you know, like. Next project, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just keep it for no. so. <laughs> How did you uh, teach yourself? Did you just teach yourself uh, guitar by ear or just uh, did you take any lessons of, of that kind? I mean, I used to take lessons when I was a kid in Argentina, but like I said, it was very just like learning tunes, not really knowing what Basically. was going on. But then I started, um, I started taking classes with this teacher in Argentina and that's when I was preparing myself to Berkeley and he told me, he told me all about the blues, the scales, the harmony, uh, you know the chords some certain rules uh, and of course then in Berkeley I learned a lot but I spent so many hours uh, outside those classes on my own just learning and learning and learning and practicing the scales with the metronome listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan it's like what is that lick that he's doing let's recreate it until you start like yeah, I remember that, like listening to something and then um, I would go to, to videos of Santana close-ups and, oh, that's what he's doing, you know? So, uh, and, and then, so I did teach myself a lot uh, of how to, how to imitate those rock and roll and blues guitar sounds. Amazing. You know? I uh, never got to see Led Zeppelin live. I was around when they were together, but I was a little too young. Yeah. But I, I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan when I was in school. Oh, yeah. Wow. That was a treat. How was that? Unbelievable. Unreal. He was just, yeah, that's, I never saw anything like that. Never will again. He's, he's one yeah. of the greatest. I mean, yeah. I saw, um, where, where was this? I went to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. This was okay. 35 years ago. And we saw TV in Ohio. Yeah. Wow. Yeah did a wonderful job in their auditorium called Memorial Auditorium. So the great, the acoustics were amazing. Yeah. It's really nice. No, that's a great band. I mean, Stevie is one of the best. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, I saw Clapton. There's an interview that Clapton talks about, about Stevie and it's very powerful. Um, he says that he was listening to, to the first song that Stevie released and he was like driving and he had to literally pull like <laughs> park the car and start calling his agents and like, you need to find out who this guy is immediately. <laughs> Not tomorrow, now, find out who this guy is. So he got in touch. And then he, 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 he said something very special about Stevie that when you listen to him compared to other players, he, he was saying that Stevie was like this open channel, right? And he, yeah, was, yeah. he was saying that sometimes even like Clapton, he plays and he, you get caught up in your mind, you know, like, oh, maybe I already did this lick or I'm repeating myself or are the people liking it? Or there's a moment that your mind starts making you doubt and then you shut it up and you keep going. But Stevie never had that dialogue. It was just flowing and flowing. And so he's just an open channel. You know, you see him solo and it's like. Yeah, just totally. His ideas never, never get old. And he, and, uh, if you look at him as a, as a guitarist point of view and you study what he's doing uh, technica, technicality wise, um, he's, he stays a lot in the same position. You know? Yeah. He yeah. stays a lot in that in just one spot, but he, he's so creative with that just one spot that the ideas just never stop coming. You know? And he's not throwing all these jazz things all over the neck. I mean, he's, he's there. He's yeah. there to stay there for like, 20 minutes and his ideas will just keep flowing, you know? Like no other, total original, wow. 
So where can we get the new uh, album uh, from Blue House? Is it on the website? Can we order it? Yeah. I mean, right now it's, it's, it's only digital. Um, you can buy the, of course, you can buy the record in Amazon or iTunes. Um, but right now it's digital in Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, everywhere, you know. Um, Good. I'll, I'll definitely be releasing some vinyls and, and, and some merch, uh, some NFTs <laughs> to go with the moment. Um, but yeah, everything is just starting, you know, we released the album a week ago. So, so all these things are going to start coming. Sounds great. Well, I appreciate your time. This has been lovely and uh, best of luck to you in the band and everybody who you work with. And hopefully we'll see you out on the road soon. Oh yeah. I would love to. We'll, we'll grab a beer in Atlanta. Please do. Yes. Yeah. I want to know when you're here. Cause I, I want to hear this stuff live. Definitely. Definitely. It's just a matter of time. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Thank you, Robert, for the call. Have a good day. Good one.